Welcome back to this Biology 6 lecture on the senses. Uh, this is part two of the senses lecture, and we're just going to continue on with uh, more senses and more sense organs. Our uh, next uh, sense organ that we're going to talk about is the ear, which of course is where your sense of hearing is located. But there's actually a, another sense in, that's also located in the ear other than hearing, and that sense is called the equilibrium sense. Uh, and we're going to talk about both of those senses of the ear, the hearing sense and the equilibrium sense in this part of the lecture. Um, but before we talk about either of those senses in the ear, let's start off with a little bit about the anatomy of the ear. So um, what you, when you look at the side of the person's head and you see that, you know, you would say, well, that's their ear sticking out of the side of their head. That's only just part of their ear. Let me show you kind of a cross section of, of, of the of the skull and um, here's the ear that you see on the outside of the person's head but this also shows other regions of the ear that um, are more inside some of the skull bones okay but starting with the part of the ear that you that you can see when you look at the side of the person's head um, that part of the ear is called the pinna here it is. Um, I said auricle here, which it's sometimes called, but uh, most often we call that part of the ear that you can see on the side of the person's head, uh, the pinna. So it's it's basically some folds of skin, and there's some uh, cartilage and, and other tissues inside of it. But anyway, that part of the ear is called the pinna. And when you look at someone's pinna, you can see that there's an ear hole, right? There's a there's a, a hole that goes goes into it. Um, the official name for that ear hole is the auditory canal. You can see it in cross section right here. Okay, the pinna and the auditory canal together are called the person's outer ear. All right. Um, the next part of the ear is this part that you see right here. That is the that region is called the middle ear. Um, and as you can see, it's got some structures to it. This part of the middle ear right here is called the tympanic membrane. Uh, its unofficial name is the eardrum, but it, it's official anatomy name is the tympanic membrane. And then after the tympanic membrane, um, there are three tiny, tiny little bones that are called the ossicles. Here's the first one, here's the second one, and there's the third ossicle um, right there. Now, let me just talk a little bit about those three ossicle bones. Uh, one interesting thing about them is that they are the tiniest bones in the human body. Let me zoom in on them a little bit. Here you go. There's the tympanic membrane there, and there's the first ossicle, second ossicle, and third ossicle right there. And yeah, they, those are the, the smallest bones in the human body. Here's kind of a neat picture. Um, it shows the, the first one there, the second one there, and the third one there. Uh, and notice that they easily fit on, on just one penny. So obviously they're, they're very, very tiny bones. And each of these ossicles has a name. The, the first one, the one that's closest to the tympanic membrane is called the malleus, which means hammer. You could kind of see it looks vaguely hammer shaped. Uh, the second ossicle bone is called the incus, which means um, anvil. I guess an anvil is where blacksmiths pound on iron with their hammers. Um, anyway, that's the incus. That's the second ossicle bone. And the third ossicle bone is called the stapes, that means stirrups, like where you sit on a horse where you put your legs, or the stirrups. I guess it reminded somebody of the, of the shape of stirrups. Anyway, so those three bones together are called the ossicles, and the ossicles plus the tympanic membrane make up the middle ear. Now, notice that the middle ear is housed inside kind of a hollow space that inside a bone. You can see they show bone tissue right here. That bone is called the temporal bone. The temporal bone is one of your skull bones. As a matter of fact, it's the skull bone that's closest to your pinna, you know, your, your, your outer ear there. Yeah, so the middle ear structures that we just talked about are all housed within a hollow space inside your temporal bone. Okay, uh, so moving inward, the innermost part of the ear um, is this part right here that's called the inner ear, that whole region there. And uh, the inner ear sort of uh, looks like a snail, right? Um, you know, if you ever looked at it like a standard garden snail, it has a curly Q shell. Certainly that's what that looks like right there. And then, you know, if you ever seen a snail 
his body sticks out of the shell, right? Or at least part of his body does. And so there's that part of the inner ear. And snails have antennas that stick up off the top of their body. And you can think of these parts of the inner ear as being like the antennas of a, of a snail. So yeah, I always think of the inner, inner ear as looking uh, a bit like a snail. Okay, but uh, obviously it's not a snail, but so what is it? Well, um, it's some, the inner ear is actually some hollow chambers in the temporal bone. And so, you know, what you see the shape here is not really a solid object inside your skull. What these shapes you're seeing here for the inner ear represent are hollow spaces inside the temporal bone. All right. Um, all right. Well, so let's um, um, talk about the, these hollow spaces in a little bit more detail. Okay. So the, um, the antennas of the snail, so to speak, these um, this part of the inner ear right here that looks like these little half circle -y things are called the semicircular canals of the inner ear. Good. And then this part right here, which I think of as the, the, the body of the snail, that part of the inner ear is called the vestibule. And the part that looks like the shell of the snail, that part of the inner ear is called the cochlea, which actually means shell. So just to review, the inner ear sort of looks like a snail, but it's really hollow chambers inside the temporal bone. The top part of it are three half circle, half circle shaped chambers called the semicircular canals. The middle part of it is a hollow chamber called the vestibule. And the part that looks like a snail shell is a hollow snail shaped chamber, snail shell shaped chamber called the cochlea. Okay. So, uh, these, uh, yeah, these, these, hollow chambers that, that form the, the inner ear. Um, there's actually a fluid that fills them, actually several different types of fluids that fill these uh, hollow chambers. But the, the major fluid, the fluid that fills most of them is called the endolymph fluid. So almost think of these as like underwater sea caves. You know, sea caves are hollow spaces in, in rock, but since they're sea caves, they're filled with seawater. These are hollow spaces in the temporal bone, but they're filled mostly with endolymph fluid. Um, okay, and something else that you find inside these um, hollow chambers of, of the of the inner ear is a type of cell called a hair cell. All three of these parts of the inner ear have these hair cells in them. Um, what are hair cells? Well, hair cells are the sensory receptors of the ear. Remember, sensory receptors are the cells inside a sense organ that detect the stimulus and change it and generate a, a, a nerve signal when they when they get uh, stimulated. Yeah, so the the hair cells are the sensory receptors of the uh, of the uh, inner ear, and you can see that the hair cell has these things that stick up like that. So this, they, these can be called the cilia of the hair cell, but they're usually just called the hairs of the hair cell. And here's the way these um, hair cells work. Um, anything that causes the cilia to bend causes the hair cell to have a nerve signal. So you can imagine that something has caused the cilia to bend. That's what triggers the hair cell to have a nerve signal. And it shoots off that nerve signal uh, to the brain. But if the cilia then straighten up again, then the hair cell stops making a nerve signal. So just um, keep that um, keep that in, 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 your, in your mind as we tr start to talk about how the uh, ear works that with these hair cells, anything that bends their cilia, it, that's what causes the hair cell to have a nerve signal. And anything that allows the cilia to be straight, that stops the hair cell from having a nerve signal. All right. Um, well, so getting back to our picture of the inner ear here, I'm going to uh, make everything else in this drawing invisible except for the inner ear. Um, here we go. Um, so remember that there are these two senses housed in in the ear, the sense of hearing and the sense of equilibrium. Um, the cochlea part of the inner ear is where your hearing sense is located, or at least that's where the major part of your hearing sense is located, is inside the cochlea of the inner ear. Whereas the vestibule and the semicircular canals part of the inner ear, that's where your equilibrium sense uh, is housed. Okay, so we're going to begin our discussion of the ear by talking about the hearing sense. Then after we finish 
the hearing sense, then we'll move on to the ear's equilibrium sense. Okay, so hearing is, you know, being able to detect sounds, to hear sounds, but what are sounds? Well, the lecture handout tells you that sounds are vibrations in the air. And so what this means is all sounds start off as something vibrating, and then those vibrations then go into the air. In other words, the, the vibrating object causes the air to vibrate. So just as an example, you know, if, uh, if uh, my daughter here, she's older than, she's a lot older than this now, but this is her when she was a kid. Um, if she were to pluck the guitar string there, the guitar string vibrates, but then it causes the surrounding air to start vibrating. And that's what the sound of the guitar string is. It's the vibrations um, in the air. And here's another example. You know, you, you hear me speaking right now. Um, the way that works is I have vocal cords that are vibrating inside my throat. And when those vocal cords vibrate, the vibrations go into the air. So we say those are the sounds of my voice are the vibrations in the air. So all sounds are, are vibrations. Just kind of re remember that. Now, obviously, some sounds are low pitch and other sounds are very high pitch. And what that comes down to, what, what if causes the pitch of a sound is the number of vibrations per second, which is called the frequency of the sound. So imagine that I'm showing you here one second worth of the sound. Um, and so there's a certain number of waves in that one second. And so if it's a, if it's a low frequency sound, in other words, uh, a small number of waves, a small number of vibrations per second, it's a low sound. But if it's a higher number of vibrations per second, if it's a higher frequency, that's a high sound, so low sound low number of vibrations per second, high sounds, more vibrations per second, higher frequency, low, high. Hey, this is kind of fun. Um, what do they say? I'm not going to quit my daytime job yet and, and go into the singing business, right? Anyway, so the, uh, the, uh, the frequency of the sound determines the pitch of it, whether it's a high pitch or low pitch. Okay, so sounds are vibrations. Now, for us to be able to hear the sound, those vibrations have to get to the cochlea. So let's see now how those vibrations in the air um, get to the cochlea. Okay, so all sounds start off as something vibrating, like the guitar string is vibrating here, um, and then those vibrations in the object become vibrations in the air. Well, those vibrations, those sounds, travel through the air, and they eventually arrive at the outer ear. Um, when those vibrations get to the outer ear, the pinna channels them, funnels them into the air here inside the auditory canal. And so now the vibrations have traveled through the air in the auditory canal. And then those vibrations arrive here at the tympanic membrane of the middle ear. And so they make the tympanic membrane start to vibrate. In other words, when, when those air vibrations coming down the auditory canal run into the tympanic membrane, they make the tympanic membrane start to vibrate. And the tympanic membrane is touching the ossicles. So now those vibrations move through the ossicles of the of the middle ear. And of course the last ossicle right here is the stapes. That's the one that is in contact with the inner ear, um, you know, the vestibule of the inner ear. So let's kind of zoom in there. So here's the vibration in this stapes ossicle and here's the vestibule region of the of the inner ear. Yeah, and so since the stapes is touching the inner ear, the vibrations now go into the inner ear. And to be a little bit more specific, remember that the inner ear is hollow chambers that are filled, or at least mostly filled, with this endolymph fluid. And so the vibrations are now vibrations in the endolymph inside the inner ear. Uh, and so you can almost think of the vibrations now as waves in the endolymph, as if the endolymph were some sort of, you know, like a lake or something of fluid inside the uh, inside the inner ear. And yeah, now think of these as almost waves that are traveling through the the endolymph. Okay, so the um, the waves, the vibrations in the endolymph. Uh, channel in uh, are channeled into the cochlea. Why? Well, remember that your cochlea is where your hearing sense is housed, or at least most of the hearing sense is located inside the cochlea. So that's why the vibrations in the endolymph are sent into the cochlea. Okay, um, when the vibrations in the endolymph get to the cochlea, uh, the vibrations of the endolymph inside the cochlea are 
turned into or, or generate uh, hearing sensory signals like you see here. Um, hearing sensory nerve signals, I should say, like you see here. And so, so that's really the job of the cochlea. It, when it receives vibrations in the endolymph, the cochlea's job is to turn them into nerve signals, in other words, to generate nerve signals. And once the cochlea has done that, once it has generated a, a nerve signal from the vibrations, that nerve signal is sent to the brain through this nerve right here that's called the cochlear nerve. And so we see the nerve signal not exiting the cochlea going into the cochlear nerve. And here's kind of a zoomed out view. Here's the cochlear nerve in green and yellow right there. Yeah, so those um, nerve signals come out of the cochlea through the cochlear nerve and they get sent to the brain. To be a little bit more specific, uh, there's a region of the cerebrum of the brain called the auditory cortex or auditory area. And that's where um, sound sensory nerve signals are sent to for interpretation. In other words, when those nerve signals from the cochlear nerve arrive at the auditory area of your cerebrum, that's when you experience the sound. All right, so it's in the cochlea that the vibrations, the sounds, are changed into a nerve signal. But how exactly does that happen? How exactly does the cochlea change the vibrations in the endolymph in, in the cochlea, uh, how does it change the vibrations in the endolymph into a, uh, into a nerve signal? Well, to understand how the cochlea does that, how it changes the vibrations in its endolymph into a nerve signal, uh, to understand that we have to think sort of three-dimensionally. So the, the cochlea, uh, yeah, as you can see, is, is shaped like a snail shell. And just like a real snail shell, it's hollow inside. You know, here's some sort of sea snail but shell but you can see yeah uh, snail shells are, are hollow inside so they've got this hollow oval shaped chamber throughout the entire snail shell and that's exactly the way the cochlea is it's a hollow chamber and it's got this oval shaped hollow space inside of it and so when I click on the button now we're gonna see the oval hollow space that's it that is the inside of the cochlea here it is. So this whole part that's kind of outlined in pink, the whole part that I'm circling here uh, with the pointer, is the hollow space inside the cochlea. Okay, um, now, so um, the uh, uh, this part of the, of the cochlea um, right here, this lower area, is filled with endolymph fluid. So you can almost think of this part of, of the cochlea as being like a, a lake of endolymph fluid. And as we'll see here in a few minutes, when the vibrations come inside the cochlea, you could, should think of those as like waves on this lake of endolymph fluid inside, inside the cochlea. Okay, and this part, uh, this structure here inside the uh, cochlea, that whole part right there, that structure right there. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to show it. So yeah, so when, when the vibrations get into the um, endolymph there inside the cochlea, think of those as waves in this lake of endolymph. But I was about to say is this region uh, inside the cochlea, all these structures right here uh, are called the organ of corti. Um, okay, and in your, in your lecture outline, we define the organ of corti as the structure inside the cochlea uh, that changes the, the vibrations into nerve signal. In other words, it's the, it's the organ of corti that changes those vibrations in the endolymph down here into, into the nerve signal. So let's kind of zoom in on the organ of corti to see what its parts are and, and how it works. Okay, so here's my um, version of the, of the organ of corti. Um, okay, so this part of the organ of corti right here, uh, the part most towards the top of the organ of corti is called the tectorial membrane. And think of this tectorial membrane as inflexible, meaning it doesn't bend, it doesn't move, it's totally rigid. That's the tectorial membrane part of the organ of corti. Um, this part right here is a hair cell. And this part of the organ of corti down here um, is called the basilar membrane. All right. And so notice the basilar membrane is sitting on top of the endolymph. So think of the basilar membrane um, as kind of floating on top of the endolymph. Okay, so the basilar membrane is a flexible membrane, uh, meaning it can bend 
and, and, and it can move. Whereas you remember the tectorial membrane is just the opposite. It's, it's uh, rigid and inflexible. It doesn't move. Um, the hair cells sit on top of the basilar membrane, but the hairs of the hair cells, the, the tips of the hairs of the hair cells are glued to the tectorial membrane. So yeah, so most of the hair cell is sitting on top of the basilar membrane, but the tips of its hairs, the tips of its cilia, are essentially glued to the tectorial membrane. Okay, so far? Okay, um, uh, very good. All right, so um, remember that the, the, uh, the, the vibrations, um, the, the sounds are, fi are, are vibrations, and when those vibrations reach the endolymph here inside the uh, cochlea, this organ of corti, oh yeah, the whole thing here is the organ of corti. The organ of corti here's job is to change those vibrations in the endolymph into nerve signals. So what, what I want to do is kind of go back a little bit more towards the beginning and talk about those vibrations, but we're eventually going to, going to come back to this uh, image here of the organ of corti to see how the organ of corti changes those vibrations into, um, in, into nerve signals. Here we go. Okay, so vibrations are sounds in the air. All vibrations start as some object vibrating, like a guitar string, and then the vibrating object puts those vibrations into the air. And so now we call those sounds in the air. The uh, vibrations in the air, the sounds travel out from the object that made the sound. And the job of your pinna is to channel those vibrations into the air of your auditory canal. When the vibrations there reach your tympanic membrane, the tympanic membrane starts to vibrate and it passes the vibrations into the ossicle bones, the malleus, the incus, and stapes, and then those vibrations then go into the endolymph that's inside, that fills the uh, inner ear, and then those vibrations now in the endolymph of the inner ear are sent down into the uh, cochlea, into the endolymph of, of the cochlea. Good, so now let's zoom back in on the cross section of the uh, of the uh, inner ear that we were looking at before. Yeah, so there's the endolymph inside the uh, inside the um, cochlea, and these are vibrations in that endolymph. So think of these as waves on the lake of the endolymph. Okay, so remember the basilar membrane sits on top of the endolymph, and remember that the basilar membrane is um, is is flexible. It, it can move. And so almost think of the basilar membrane as like one of those plastic pool covers. You know, maybe you own a pool or you know somebody who owns a pool and they put a plastic pool cover on the surface of the pool. Well, you know, if there were some vibrations in the pool water, then that plastic pool cover is flexible, right? So it would start moving if there were, uh, if there were waves going through the pool, right? And so that's what happens as those vibrations reach the endolymph inside the cochlea because the basilar membrane is flexible those vibrations in the endolymph make the basilar membrane start rocking back and forth. It can move, it's flexible. And since the hair cells sit on top of the basilar membrane, those vibrations make the hair cells start rocking back and forth. But because the tips of the cilia, the tips of the hairs of the hair cell are glued to the tectorial membrane and the, te the tectorial membrane doesn't move, that ends up bending the cilia, right? Uh, as the hair cell rocks back and forth. Um, and so who remembers, what does a hair cell do when its cilia get bent? And yes, you're right. The answer is it generates a nerve signal. And so notice that this is how, this is what we wanted to happen. Uh, so for our sense of hearing is that we wanted to change the stimulus, you know, the vibrations, the sounds into a nerve signal. That's what exactly what this whole thing is doing. So you can see here how the, how the organ of corti uh, changes these vibrations in the endolymph into nerve signals because the, uh, the vibrations make the basilar membrane of the organ of corti rock back and forth, which makes the hair cell of the organ of corti rock back and forth, which ends up bending the cilia, and that generates the, uh, the sound sensory nerve signals, which then travel through the, um, uh, through the hair cells and they go up into the cochlear nerve, and, well, from there, you know, they go to the auditory area of the cerebrum and that area of your brain interprets those nerve signals from the cochlear nerve um, as sounds. Kind of cool. Um, well, um, you know, this is just kind of my cartoon 
of the organ of Corti here inside the cochlea. Let me actually show you a, a real one, a real actual photograph through a microscope. It's kind of cool. All right, so this area right here is uh, where the endolymph is. You know, that's where that lake of endolymph I was showing you earlier. Um, this right here, well, this whole thing right here is the organ of Corti. This right here is the tectorial membrane. That's the hard and flexible membrane. This right here, that thin sort of pinkish strip right there, is the basilar membrane. That's the flexible one that sits on top of this lake of endolymph. And these cells right here that are between the basilar membrane and the tectorial membrane, those are the hair cells. And you can't really see it here, but remember the tips of the hairs of the hair cells are embedded in the tectorial membrane. They are glued to the tectorial membrane so that when the vibrations in the endolymph make the basilar membrane on those hair cells um, rock back and forth like you see here that bends the cilia and that makes the hair cell have its nerve signal which it sends to the brain and that's how you experience sounds from the vibrations that, that come inside your ear. Okay, now you know how the sense of hearing works, and uh, just remember that the sense of hearing, or at least most of the sense of hearing, is housed inside the cochlea. Uh, now, of course, the, the, the cochlea here is part of the inner ear. Uh, you know, the, the outer ear and the middle ear are, are also involved in your sense of hearing because those help channel the vibrations into the cochlea, but it's the cochlea is the most important part of your hearing sense because that's where those vibrations uh, are used to generate the nerve signals that actually go to your brain for hearing. Okay, anyway, so the cochlea is the, is the center of your sense of hearing. But remember that the ear also has another sense that's housed in, in the ear, and that is the, uh, the equilibrium sense. And here we go. And the equilibrium sense is housed in other parts of the of the of the inner ear the equal equilibrium sense sense is housed in the three semicircular canals and in the vestibule of the inner ear so well there you have it for the inner ear the cochlea is where the sense of hearing is and the vestibule and semicircular canals are where your equilibrium sense uh, is located so let's start off by defining the equilibrium sense uh, in your lecture outline, it says equilibrium sense is the sense of balance and movement. So what does that mean? Uh, balance basically means that you're able to stand upright without any significant swaying or leaning. Now, obviously, if you're a tightrope walker, you have to have a really good sense of balance. But just, you know, for, for normal people, having balance means that you're able to, to stand upright without any significant amount of leaning or, or tilting. Um, the other aspect of your equilibrium sense is your ability to sense movement. And what we mean by that is you, you know you can feel which direction your body is being moved. And here's an example of that. Uh, some people, when they're riding a roller coaster, shut their eyes, right? Um, but even if you're shutting your eyes on the roller coaster, you can feel whether the roller coaster is moving your body forward or backward or left or right or up and down. And so, you, so you, yeah, you have a sense, you have an ability to sense which direction your body is being moved. That's also part of your equilibrium sense, being able to detect movement of your body, the direction that your body is being moved. Okay, so the um, equilibrium sense um, is, is housed in those two parts of the inner ear, the uh, vestibule and the semicircular canals. Um, let's uh, start off by talking about the part of the equilibrium sense that's housed here in the in the uh, vestibule of the uh, uh, of the inner ear. Okay, so inside the vestibule, there are some structures called the otolith organs. The otolith organs are there inside the vestibule, and um, there's actually two otolith organs inside your vestibule. One is called the utricle and one is called the saccule. And let's not worry what the, the difference between them is. The point is the utricle and saccule are both otolith organs and you find them inside the vestibule. Okay, the, uh, these otolith organs in the vestibule, um, they are responsible for what they call your linear movement, for detecting linear movement of your body. And linear movement means any movement of your body that's straight line motion. For instance, if your body moves up or down, you know, straight up, straight down, or straight left or straight right, or straight forward or straight backward, 
all those are are linear. They're they're straight line movements of your body. Uh, no, as as a counterexample, spinning movements are not linear movements because spinning uh, movements are are circular circular movements, not straight line movements. But anyway, what I'm saying here is these autolith organs inside your vestibule, their job is to detect linear movements uh, of your body. And so let's talk about how that works. Well, um, each of these autolith organs inside your vestibule has some structures inside of it called macula. So the autolith organs are essentially made of some structures called macula. And let's imagine zooming in on one of those macula. Um, here it is. Okay, um, yeah, this whole thing you see here is, is one macula. And the macula inside these autolith organs um, have some parts. Uh, part of each macula is gel. What I'm showing here in this light blue color, think of that as kind of a blob of gel, almost like a little slab of jello, right? Um, sitting on top of the gel of each macula are some dense um, calcium granules called autoliths. Here they are. So all these things here are these autoliths. Um, and think of those as like really heavy, dense rocks that are sitting on top of this gel of the macula. Let me show you something kind of neat, a, a, a microscopic photograph of some of these autoliths sitting on top of the gel of the macula. It's kind of interesting looking. Yeah, so all these things that look like these stones, these weird looking rocks are, um, are autoliths, you know, these dense calcium granules, and you can see them all sitting on top of the surface of that gel. That's what's being shown right there. Anyway, so, um, that those are parts of each macula, these heavy, dense autolith organs sitting on top of the gel. Yeah, so almost think of these as like rocks sitting on top of a, of a slab of jello. Um, the last part of the macula, I think you recognize right here, is a hair cell. And the, the, the cilia of the hair cell are embedded in, um, in, in the gel of the macula. Okay, um, so now let's talk about how these macula of the autolith organs uh, detect linear movement for you. Okay, and to give an example, we'll have this fellow right here demonstrate linear movement. He's just kind of standing there, and all of a sudden he's going to zip to one side. Whoosh, you know, that's linear movement. He's moving in a, his body in a, in a straight line. Um, okay, so let's see what happened to those macula inside his autolith organs when he zipped in that direction right here. Well, you know from experience that if you're driving your car and you make a sudden turn, stuff slides across the seat of your car, right? Like if, like if you have your phone uh, sitting on the seat next to you and you make a sudden turn, that phone's going to slide across the seat. So any sort of change in direction, any sort of linear uh, uh, movement of your car uh, will cause objects to slide, to move. And so think of these big, heavy Mac, uh, autolith um, structures here as like the stuff on your car seat. And so if you suddenly steer your car in, suddenly in one direction, that's going to cause them to slide, right? Well, since these autoliths, um, as they start to slide, they're big and heavy, uh, they end up bending the gel as they slide in one direction. And since the cilia of the hair cell of the macula are embedded in that gel, when the gel bends, the cilia bend. And who remembers what happens when you bend the cilia of a hair cell? That's right, it fires off an... Oop, sorry, I clicked too much. There we go. Uh, that's right, it, it fires off a nerve signal. Um, and so that is how the macula inside your autolith organs senses... Um, linear movements when you have any sort of li linear movement like a sudden move to left or right or up or down or backwards or forwards of, of your body it causes the um, the uh, auto list to slide just like stuff slides across your car car seat uh, when you make a sudden turn in your car bends the gel bends the hair the cilia of the hair cells and that causes them to shoot off a nerve signal to the brain and that nerve signal travels to the brain um, the nerve that you see right here that's carrying those nerve signals uh, is called the vestibular nerve because, you know, it comes from the, the vestibule right there. Uh, yeah, and so your brain interprets those signals from the vestibular nerve as the feeling that your body is being moved in a particular direction. Now, um, you know from experience in your car, when you stop making 
that turn. You know, when you're no longer turning, the stuff s stops sliding. And so what that means inside the macula is the, the um, otoliths would center themselves again. So the gel goes back to its normal shape. So the cilia are no longer bent. And so the hair cells no longer send the signal. And so when you stop your when your body is no longer moving that direction, um, you no longer feel like you're moving in that direction because these signals from the uh, hair cells of the macula are no longer arriving at your brain. Now let's look at the another example of the same thing. Now this fellow is going to move in another linear direction, whoosh, off in that direction. And so now let's look inside the macula. Same principles, uh, just like stuff slides across your car seat when you make a sudden turn, a sudden movement of your car. That will cause the autoliths to move uh, and that bends the gel, and that bends the cilia inside the hair cells, and that causes them to shoot a nerve signal off to the brain, and so you feel like you're moving in, you know, in whatever direction that was. And you know, once you stop, you're moving in that direction. Oh yeah, so there's it's being shot through the uh, the nerve signal is being uh, shot through the vestibular nerve up to the brain. Anyway, once you stop moving, the autolysis go back to their normal position so the gel straightens out so the cilia straightens out and so the nerve signal stops so that is how the macula in your autolith organs in the vestibule give you your equilibrium sense of linear movement uh, you know again it's the autoliths moving when you make a linear movement forwards backwards left right up down that bends the gel that bends the cilia that are of the hair cells that are embedded in the gel and that causes nerve signals to uh, go to the brain which you experience as, as movement of your body now um, so remember that uh, another part of your sense of equilibrium is also your sense of balance the ability to to stand upright without any any significant swaying well it's actually also these macula inside your autolith organs that give you your sense of balance they're not just for giving you your sense of movement of the body they also give you your sense of balance and here's how that works um the, the key for standing with balance is to detect if you're leaning uh you know if you're able to detect when you're starting to lean then you're able to take corrective actions to stop yourself from leaning and that's what that's what standing with balance is okay so um when you're standing with balance, when you're standing upright, the autoliths are not being pulled off center, so they're they're not bending the gel, so there there are no nerve signals going to your brain when you're standing upright. But let's say you start to lean a little bit. Well, then gravity is going to start pulling those autoliths, right? And that's going to bend the gel, which bends the cilia of the hair cells inside the gel of the macula. And remember, that causes nerve signals to the brain. And so what I'm saying is if you start to lean even a little bit, that your brain gets the signal that you're starting to lean from these um, you know, from these hair cells inside the macula of your autolith organs. And so your brain is aware that you're starting to lean, and then your brain uh, sends signals to various muscles in your legs to help you straighten up again. So I'm just saying that these macula structures in your, in your, um, in your autolith organs not only give you your sense of linear movement of the body, but also allow you to stand with balance. Okay, so your autolith organs, which are inside your vestibule, give you the ability to sense linear movement of your body and also give you give you your sense of balance but remember there's a, a um another uh, some there we go yeah so the autolith organs uh, uh give you your sense of linear movement and also your sense of balance but there's one more aspect of your equilibrium sense of movement and that's the ability to detect uh what they call uh circular movement or rotational movements um, and that's what the semicircular canals are for. So the semicircular canals are also involved in your sense of equilibrium, your sense of movement of your body, but they specialize in detecting, um, you know, what they call rotational movements, which means any sort of, uh, like spinning movement. Like if you think of a ice skater, they can spin around really, really quickly in circles. And yeah, so your ability to sense any sort of spinning or rotation movement, um, that's done by these three semicircular canals uh, up there at the top uh, of the inner ear. Okay, um, now I'll just mention that that part always seemed 
kind of intuitive to me because the semicircular canals are there are three of them and they're each shaped like a half circle you know there's one there and there's a half circle there and there's the third half circle there and you know it, it sort of makes sense to me that they sense circular movement spinning movement be, and that's why they're shaped like that's why they're shaped like half circles uh so to speak okay so let's uh now see them a little bit more closely in, in terms of how each one uh, how the semicircular canals detect um, rotational movements for us. And we're going to look more closely at just this semicircular canal right uh, right here, this one right here. But what we're going to learn about how this semicircular canal works, how it senses uh, rotational movements for us, the same concepts apply to the other two semicircular canals, to that one there and that one there. But anyway, let's imagine zooming in on this semicircular canal right there. Okay, so um, just like all structures of the inner ear, the semicircular canals are hollow structures. Here's a picture of that semicircular canal right there. And they are filled with endolymph fluid. The green stuff in this picture is the endolymph fluid that fills that semicircular canal. Okay, um, each semicircular canal um, has a, a, a wide end at one part uh, that's called the ampulla of the semicircular canal. So yeah, where the semicircular canal gets bigger, gets wider here at the end, we call that region there the ampulla of the semicircular canal. And it's the, the ampulla is a bigger part of the semicircular canal because it houses something. There's something inside there. And what's inside there is a blob of flexible gel called a cupula. So each semicircular canal, each of your three semicircular canals has one ampulla region and it has a cupula, a blob of gel inside that ampulla region. Uh, and lastly, it, it embedded within that cupula gel are some hair cells, like you see here. And this is similar to what we saw a few moments ago for the macula, right? The cilia of the hair cells are embedded in the gel, in, in the cupula gel here. Okay, so how does this, all these structures that I'm showing you here, how do they sense rotational movement for us well so if you're not spinning if you're not doing any rotational movement like here's this ice skater uh, looks like she's you know skating but she's not spinning right now so if you're not doing any rotational movement the endolymph inside your semicircular canals is not moving right you know if if you're not really moving to speak of then fluids liquids don't don't move around either yeah so if you're not spinning think of the endolymph as not moving inside your in your semicircular canals but if you do start to spin that makes the endolymph start to flow and to sort of justify that um, instead of thinking about endolymph think of a cup of coffee if you were to hold a cup of coffee in your hand like you see here and you weren't spinning you know you were standing still then the coffee really wouldn't flow it wouldn't move anywhere but if you started spinning around with that cup of coffee in your hand the coffee would start to flow right as you spun around matter of fact it would start to spill out the edge of the cup and so what, what i'm just saying is here is that, is that rotational movement makes liquids flow if you start spinning um, the liquids in you will start to flow and so that's what the endolymph that's what happens to the endolymph in your semicircular canals when you start spinning that makes the endolymph start to flow through the semicircular canals. And as that endolymph starts flowing, it um, pushes against the cupula, that blob of gel right there, right? Um, and so, yeah, the rotation makes the endolymph flow, and that flowing endolymph bends the cupula. And since the cilia are embedded in the cupula gel, the cilia get bent of the hair cells. And you know what happens when you bend the cilia of a hair cell, it starts to generate nerve signals. And so those nerve signals generate from that hair cell flow through, uh, actually, the, it's also called the vestibular nerve, even though it's actually coming from the, uh, uh, from the semicircular canals, that's also part of the vestibular nerve. Anyway, the nerve signals from those uh, hair cells that are inside the cupula in the ampulla of the semicircular canal, uh, those those nerve signals get sent to the brain through this vestibular nerve right here. And regions of your brain that receive those signals uh, interpret that as as the as the feeling of of spinning. Now, um, just like with your cup of coffee, if you stop spinning, 
the coffee would stop moving around eventually. And so, yeah, when you stop spinning, the endolymph in your semicircular canal stops flowing, and that allows the gel, the cupula gel, to go back to its normal position, which straightens out the cilia, and so no more signals. And so that's um, that's why you no longer get the sensation that you're spinning when you stop spinning. Oh, I should mention one thing. If you, you know, getting back to your cup of coffee, yeah, if, if you held a cup of coffee in your hand and you spin, spun around, the coffee would start to flow, would start to spill out the edge of the cup, right? Um, but when you stop, the coffee wouldn't stop right away. The coffee would sort of slosh around for a bit even after you stop spinning. And so even after you stop spinning, it takes a few minutes for the endolymph to, to, to come to a halt. And that's what you experience as being dizzy. You know, if you spin around a, a lot and you stop, for the next few minutes, you still get the sensation that you're kind of spinning and off balance. That's why, because the endolymph has not fully stopped yet. So it's still bending your cupula gel a little bit, which is still bending the cilia a little bit. So you're still getting, your brain is still getting some signals of spinning, even though you yourself uh, have stopped. Okay, well, that about brings us to the end of our discussion uh, of the ear. So just to um, remind you, we talked about the various parts of the ear, the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear, and we talked about how there are um, two senses uh, that are housed in the ear. Um, in the cochlea of the inner ear is where your hearing sense is housed, or at least most of the hearing sense is, is housed inside the cochlea. And in the vestibule and semicircular canals of your inner ear, that's where your equilibrium sense is housed, your ability to uh, stand with balance and to, to detect movement of your body, linear movements or uh, circular rotational movements of your body. Okay, the last two senses that we are going to talk about in this lecture on the senses are the sense of taste and the sense of smell. Now, both of those senses, both your, your taste sense and your smell sense, involve detecting molecules. Like uh, here we see this woman who's smelling the slice of pizza she's about to eat, and then she's going to eat it and taste the pizza. Uh, and so both of those involve detecting uh, molecules. When you smell something, you are detecting the molecules that come off the thing that go into the air, that come off the object and go into the air. That's molecule detection for a sense of smell. And when you taste something, you're tasting the molecules. Uh, what you're detecting are the molecules inside the food, you know, like it's sugars and it's proteins, for instance. Um, that gives you your sense of taste of the food. But again, it involves detection of molecules. Yes, so your, tense of, your sense of taste and sense of smell are all about uh, detecting molecules. And both of those senses, remember that each sense has its own particular organ and obviously your sense of smell is housed inside your nose and your sense of taste is housed inside your your oral cavity your mouth uh, but uh, remember that for each inside each sense organ there are sensory receptors that detect the stimulus and change it into a nerve signal well for your sense of smell and for your sense of taste both of those senses use a type of sensory receptor called a chemoreceptor which i'm showing uh, like this cell right here and uh, so, yeah, these chemoreceptors, uh, the word chemo means molecule. And, and so they're basically molecule detecting uh, sensory receptors. They get stimulated by molecules. That's what makes them generate their, uh, their, their nerve signal. Um, so, yeah, here's the way it works with one of these chemoreceptor sensory receptors. Um, the molecules bind to... Uh, that it's going to detect bind to its its dendrites like you see here, and that's what triggers it to have a nerve signal. And it, of course, it shoots that nerve signal um, off to the brain. But the but the point is that uh, its dendrites bind to molecules, and that's what causes a chemoreceptor cell to to have its nerve signal. Um, now, as it turns out, each chemoreceptor specializes in detecting just one type of molecule. So for instance, uh, let's call this molecule A, for instance. This chemoreceptor is designed to detect molecule A and only molecule A. Um, if there was a different molecule, molecule B, uh, that would have to be detected by a different chemoreceptor. And some other molecule, let's call molecule C, that would need to be detected by uh, a different chemoreceptor than that. So yeah, so each chemoreceptor um, is a specialist in detecting just one and only one type of molecule. But, you know, you can smell 
many different types of molecules and you can taste very many different types of molecules and so what i'm saying is that in your nose there are many different types of chemoreceptors to allow you to to smell a wide variety of different molecules and likewise uh, in your mouth there are different types of chemoreceptors to allow you to taste different molecules in your food okay let's start off uh talking about our sense of smell the official name for your sense of smell is the olfactory sense and obviously it's it's housed inside your nose right okay um so here's the way it works when you smell an object like smelling some flowers here uh when you inhale what, what you're actually smelling are the molecules from the object that go into the air and when you inhale those molecules in the air from the object go inside your nose and to be a little bit more specific they go inside your nasal cavity this area right here in this diagram is the hollow space inside your nose that's your nasal cavity and why do the molecules that you want to smell go inside your nasal cavity well in the roof of your nasal cavity are some uh, sensory receptors called the olfactory receptors so the olfactory receptors are a type of chemoreceptor they are the chemoreceptors that detect the molecules in the air so yeah you you smell the flower and so what you're bringing into your nasal cavity are some of the molecules from the flower and that are in the air and those go into your nasal cavity on the roof of your nasal cavity all are those olfactory receptors those are the uh, cells that are shown there in yellow and notice that the uh, dendrites of these olfactory receptors stick down into the nasal cavity and so that allows them to bind to these scent molecules these smell molecules that you've inhaled inside your nasal cavity and well you know the way it works when these olfactory receptors uh you know bind to the uh, scent molecule that they are there to detect that causes them to generate nerve signals which then get sent up uh to the to the brain and there's a region of your uh cerebrum called your um, olfactory area or olfactory cortex and that's what receives and interprets those nerve signals from your olfactory receptors in, in your in your nasal cavity okay now as it turns out uh, there are about 380 different types of olfactory receptors in your nasal cavity remember that um, olfactory receptors are or a type of chemoreceptor they detect molecules and each chemoreceptor is a specialist in, de in detecting just one type of molecule so uh, what i'm saying is your sense of smell can detect uh, about 380 different types of molecules because you have about 380 different types of olfactory receptors each one a specialist in detecting just one particular type of, of scent molecule okay that is how your olfactory uh, your sense of smell works the final sense that we are going to talk about is your sense of taste the official name for your sense of taste is your gustatory sense and um, the major sense organ for your gustatory sense is is your tongue and if you were to somehow look at the surface of the tongue uh, you know using a magnifying glass or something you would see that the surface of your tongue has these bumps on it these are called papilla on the uh, sides of the papilla are some structures called taste buds. Each papilla has many taste buds on it. Um, and so the, 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 the taste buds are clusters of, of taste cells. Imagine we're going to zoom in on just some of these taste buds right here. Here we go. Uh, so here, here's a taste bud, and here's a taste bud, and here's a taste bud, and here's one right here. So you, you can see each taste bud are some clusters of some cells and um, those those cells are called taste cells the taste cells are the chemoreceptors for your sense of taste remember chemoreceptors are uh, sensory receptors that detect molecules and so yeah the the chemoreceptors that detect uh, the taste molecules the molecules in the foods that you've eaten are called uh, taste cells some older textbooks call them gustatory receptors but most modern textbooks uh, call these uh call them taste cells so anyway yeah so the uh, um, taste cells are the chemoreceptors that detect molecules that uh, from your foods that are dissolved uh, in your saliva um, okay so here's the way it works let's imagine um, 
that the person's eating some food. Let's make it a nice chicken drumstick right here. So the molecules of the food, like its proteins and its salts and its sugars, for example, the molecules of the food dissolve in the saliva. Think of the white region of this uh, picture being the saliva in, in your oral cavity. And so the molecules from the food diffuse into the saliva and those food molecules eventually run into and contact the taste cells of your taste buds like you see there. Here's a close-up of some of those taste buds and yeah, the molecules from your food diffusing through the saliva eventually arrive at those um, taste cells and then they bind to the um, to the the ends of the taste cells like you see here and remember that taste cells are um, are a type of chemoreceptor and so when a taste cell binds to the molecule that it's supposed to be detecting it generates a nerve signal and that those nerve signals um, eventually travel to the brain and in, in your brain there's an area called the gustatory area of the cerebrum that receives and interprets those signals and you experience that as the as the taste uh, of the food all right, so here's a close-up of, of a taste bud, the black thing, so to speak. There are actually five types of taste cells. Um, one type of taste cell, which I'm showing in blue right here, um, is called a salty taste cell because when it sends off a nerve signal to the brain, your brain interprets the signals from this type of taste cell uh, as a salty taste. And what it's actually detecting, the type of molecule in the food that it detects, are sodium ions. And here's why that, why that makes sense. Uh, salt, you know, like table salt that you buy at the store, um, is made out of sodium ions and chloride ions. And so these salty um, taste cells, what they key in on and what they detect are the sodium ions in the salt. That's how they detect that, you, that, that there is salt in your food. The second of the five types of taste cells uh, is called a, a sweet cell or sweet detecting cell. And this type of taste cell detects sugars in the foods that you've eaten. Uh, if you think back to that lecture towards the beginning of the semester on biological molecules, we talked about the carbohydrate molecules. And within that part of the lecture, we learned that uh, there are two types of carbohydrates that are sugars that are called monosaccharides and disaccharides. And so if your foods contain either monosaccharides or disaccharides, then your foods contain sugars. Those are the sugars. And so that's the type of molecules that this sweet uh, detecting taste cell bind to and detect are, are the sugars. The third of the five um, taste cell types um, detects sour tastes for you. In other words, when this one has a nerve type has a nerve signal, your brain interprets that as a sour taste. And what it's actually detecting in the food are acids. Um, m several foods that we have have acids in them. Just for example, uh, lemons have a type of acid called citric acid and vinegar has a type of acid in it called acetic acid. Many foods have acids in them. And yeah, those acids are what this type of taste cell detect. Now, if you remember back to an earlier lecture that we did on water, we learned that acids are molecules that make hydrogen ions, H plus ions. And so um, you could also say that this sour detecting um, uh, taste cell is actually detest detecting the hydrogen ions from the acids. You can either say it detects acids or it detects hydrogen ions. E either one is, a, is the correct description of how this, uh, this sour detecting taste cell works. The next taste cell, this one down here, I'm going to color it in yellow, um, is a bitter detecting um, taste cell. So uh, the brain interprets the nerve signals from that type of taste cell as a bitter taste. And in terms of the molecules that it detects, I said alkaloids. And here's what that's about. Um, alkaloids are molecules that, uh, make, that are made by plants as a defense against being eaten. Now, plants don't want to be eaten. I mean, no living thing wants to be eaten, right? But unlike animals, plants can't get up and run away if some animal comes up to eat them, right? And so plants have involved a, an interesting kind of defense. Plants make uh, molecules called alkaloids. And many of these alkaloids are bitter tasting. And so that's how the plant is defending itself from being eaten. It makes these bitter tasting alkaloid molecules. And so that... Um, uh, uh, that stops that that inhibits the animal from from uh, eating the plant now some but not all of these alkaloids 
are poisonous. Um, some are just bitter, but they're not poisonous at all. Just to give an example, chocolate um, is is full of um, alkaloids that are bitter tasting, but not not poisonous at all. At least not to human beings. Are chocolates are poisonous to dogs, but not to human beings. Uh, what was the point I was making? Oh yeah, so you might say, well, chocolate tastes pretty good. Well, that's because they load it up with sugar and other things to make it taste better. If you've ever eaten 100% pure dark chocolate, it is very bitter, let, let me tell you. Um, anyway, the point I'm making is that alkaloids are defensive molecules that plants make bitter tasting molecules, some of which are poison, but others are not. Um, uh, anyway, and that's, that's the type of molecules that this bitter detecting uh, taste cell detects our, our alkaloids. It also detects bases. Remember from our lecture on water that bases are the opposites of acids. Bases are molecules that remove hydrogen ions from solutions and these uh, bitter tasting, um, bitter detecting taste cells also detect bases as well as alkaloids. And then lastly, this uh, fifth and last type of taste cell um, is called the umami uh, detecting taste cell. Uh, umami is a Japanese word. It means savory or meaty. And it, it, it's named with a Japanese word because it was discovered by some researchers in, in Japan. This particular uh, taste cell was discovered by some Japanese researchers. Um, anyway, uh, so yeah, uh, the brain interprets signals from this umami detecting taste cell as a meaty or, or a savory test uh, taste. And here's why that makes sense. Uh, meats are very high in proteins, and proteins are made out of amino acids. So anytime you're eating something meaty, you're putting amino acids into your saliva. And so that's why this one gives you a meaty taste when it detects amino acids, because, because uh, amino acids are building blocks of proteins, and proteins are very high, uh, are, are found at very high levels in meats. All right, uh, so uh, just summarizing, your uh, the official name for your sense of taste is your uh, gustatory uh, sense. Okay, let me kind of wrap up our discussion of smell and taste by imagine that someone is eating um, a drumstick. Well, you don't have to imagine it. You can see it right there. And so, you know, here's the person's nasal cavity, and right here, this is their oral cavity. There's their tongue. You can see their teeth right there. So they uh, put the uh, drumstick in their mouth, and so as they're eating it, you know, the molecules are coming off this drumstick. Some of these molecules go into the air, so those are going to be part of the smell of the drumstick. And some of these molecules go into the saliva, and so they're going to be part of the taste of the drumstick. And so notice that the brain is getting, when we, have, when we eat something, the brain is getting smell nerve signals, olfactory nerve signals, simultaneously that it's all the brain is also getting taste nerve signals from down here in the oral cavity um yeah so every time you eat something you are tasting it and smelling it simultaneously now remember however though that we only have five different types of taste cells uh, you know cells that detect the molecules in the food taste molecules but we have about 380 different types of olfactory receptors to detect the, the smell of the food. And so what that means is that um, the inhaled molecules, the scent molecules of your food contribute a lot more to your experience of eating the food than the taste, just because you have, you know, you can detect more molecules, more different types of molecules from the smell of the food than you can actually detect from the taste of the food. Yeah, so your, your olfactory sense contributes more to your experience of eating the food than the, than the actual taste does. Uh, and yet, when, when we eat the foods, we tend to think uh, of everything that we're experiencing as the taste of the food. And so what I'm just saying is, yeah, the, when you eat something, you say, oh, this tastes delicious. A lot of what you think is the taste of the food is actually the smell of the food. And here's how you can show that from experience. If you've ever had a really bad cold where your nasal cavity has become plugged up with a lot of mucus, well, you can't smell anything anymore, and you probably notice foods become very bland tasting, and that's why, because uh, the mucus has blocked the smell molecules of the food, the scent molecules, from getting to your olfactory receptors, so you're no longer smelling the food. All you're experiencing is your sense of taste, and since that can only detect five types of molecules in the food, um, it, you experience it as a, as a very bland uh, taste for the food. 
Okay, well, that just brings that brings us to the end of our discussion of the senses. Let me get back to this, uh, finish off with this slide right here. I made a, a table of the, um, of the senses that we've talked about. So we talked about touch, sense, vision, sense, hearing, equilibrium, taste, and smell. And actually, we, we also talked about proprioception, which is, remember, your sense of which position your body's limbs are in. Uh, but I, for whatever reason, I skipped that on the table. Anyway, so this lists uh, almost all of the senses that we've talked about in this lecture. And for each one, I talked about what its sensory receptors are called and what those sensory receptors are detecting. Let's just quickly wrap up by looking at these. For your sense of touch, the sensory receptors are, are called cutaneous receptors. And there's actually many different types. And remember, you don't have to remember the names of their individual uh, ones, but some of these um, cutaneous receptors detect pressure. Some detect the um, texture of whatever it is you're touching. Some detect the temperature of whatever it is that you're touching. Some detect um, pain. So if, if the thing that you're touching has damaged your, your skin or cut your skin, uh, those are also part of your touch st uh, stimulus. Um, with your sense of vision, the sensory receptors are called photoreceptors. They uh, detect light. With your sense of hearing, the sensory receptors are called hair cells. They detect vibrations because sounds are vibrations. With your sense of equilibrium, which remember, which is your sense of being able to stand with balance and and detecting movement of your body. It's also hair cells uh, that are the sensory receptors, and so they detect movement of the body, and they detect whether you're leaning or not, which allows you to stand with balance. For your sense of taste, the cells are uh, the sensory receptors are called taste cells. They detect molecules in the food. There's about there, there are five types of these taste cells: uh, sweet detecting, uh, salty detecting, sour detecting, bitter detecting, and umami, which means uh, meaty or savory detecting. Uh, and for your sense of smell, your olfactory sense, the receptors are called olfactory receptors, and they detect uh, molecules in the air. Oops, looks like I misspelled molecules. Anyway, they detect molecules in the air. And remember, you have about 380 different types of olfactory receptors, so you can detect about 380 different types of smell molecules. Alrighty, well, that is it for this lecture on the senses. Thank you for listening. As always, I advise you to now do the online review questions for this chapter for the census chapter and I will see you in the next lecture.